Well, welcome everybody, and thanks again for having me. Um, it is true I'm a hydromaniac, and uh, I, I maybe you'll understand why as, as we get into this. It all started a thousand years BCE in China, of course, where the first recorded water power was utilized. Uh, of course, in New England, it began a little bit later, you know, 1700s, maybe even late 1600s, when the early settlers and colonists and farmers needed some extra leverage to get things done, to grind grain, to, to cut lumber. Um, there is such a great history on water power, and I'm sort of a history fanatic, and it's, it's, it's a good field to be in if you, if you like things from the past, because there are, of course, mills all over the place, particularly in New England, but really all over the country. And I've spent a lot of my adulthood and my childhood actually exploring some of those mills. Um, how did I first get bitten by the hydro bug? Well, it happened when I was 11 years old, and my family had just moved to Concord, Massachusetts. And we had just had a great big Thanksgiving Day meal, and then we had our postprandial hike, and we hiked through the woods, and lo and behold, stumbled on an old abandoned hydroelectric power plant. And to my young eyes, it just seemed like the most amazing thing. There was this dilapidated dam and a building with the glass and doors broken out and, and a big old carcass of a pancake generator that, you know, at some point in the distant past must have meant a lot to a lot of people because it probably lit up the whole village or something. And now it's just this, this carcass. Um, and it was just a year or two after that, that the first oil embargoes took place and people in this country really started to talk about alternative energy. And in my little mind, it, it just the wheel started spinning and I thought to myself, oh, small hydropower, this could solve our problems. And you know, I was naive, but, but it, it did sort of set me on a course. And um, I, you know, as I could as a kid and then into high school, I would explore old mills. As I said, I even dragged my girlfriend along to old mills. And once in a while, we'd even knock on the door of an operating power plant at some utility company and they'd let us in because that was back then. And, and we'd tour the hydro plant and learn how it works and so forth. Um, so then Jimmy Carter came along. And in 1978, he passed a really fantastic law called PURPA, the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act. It's probably one of the greatest things that's happened in this country in the last 50 years, and hardly anybody knows about it. But what it did was it opened up the grid, the electric grid, to small independent power producers like I am now. And before that time, the grid was pretty much controlled by all the utilities and nobody was allowed to, to play their game. So, but PURPA allowed us to jump in and immediately there was a, a hydro gold rush and people, mostly investors from you know, New York and Boston and so forth, started flying up and down rivers all over the place looking for abandoned dams and then you know investing in them and attempting to get them back online. Um, you know I was still pretty young so so I didn't get into it just quite yet. I want to jump around a little bit and you will find that I take a number of quantum leaps in this talk but don't worry I'll try to bring all the threads back together. Um, 1674 Hinsdale what is now, Hinsdale, New Hampshire, the lower Ashwilet River Basin. There was a man named Stephen Belden, who was a farmer, and, and he had a friend named Peter Evans, who was a farmer and sort of a proto-industrialist. And the town decided that it would be great if these guys could build a mill to help grind their grain. And I, I found this in the old history books. It, it says, they gave the land to Belden, provided ye build a sufficient grist mill and maintain it forever quote unquote. And so he and his buddy Peter Evans did exactly that. They built a grist mill. It had a good thing going. Um, Peter Evans' son, Lieutenant John Evans, uh, had a son, Ethne, who was pretty handy with this mill stuff and became a millwright and for years kept the water power mills running in the lower Eshwilet Basin. Um, now I'm going to jump ahead a few years to 1882, where Thomas Edison fires up his first electric plant in downtown Manhattan, it's coal fired. But the same year, his technology, direct current, DC, is used at the first hydroelectric plant in this country in Appleton, Wisconsin. A few years later, the first AC hydro plant comes online in Telluride, Colorado. This is about the time that Nikola Tesla, who's inventing AC, teams up with George Westinghouse, who's you know, very wealthy, but sort of gentle and avuncular type of fellow. And on the other side of the war of the currents, Thomas Edison, who's DC, is teaming up with the crafty JP Morgan. 
Um, and this is the war of the currents. And of course, Tesla's technology wins because AC is frankly better for this type of thing. But JP Morgan, of course, is the more ruthless capitalist and steals the technology and eventually makes off with it so that he can control the hydroelectric resource as the country is building out its, its hydro in the early 1900s. Um, in fact, it was Tesla's technology that was first developed at Niagara Falls for, for our first really big hydro plant. Um, meanwhile, in Little Keene, New Hampshire, where, where I live and where you, you all know of Keene, even if you don't all live there, uh, you know, it always takes a little later for technology to get to Keene, but, but soon enough in 1886, they wanted some electricity. They heard about this crazy new thing called electric, electric light. And they developed a coal gas fired generator to make electricity to run their lights, but it was, it was fossil fueled. So it all started in Keene with fossil fuels. A few years later, they built a small hydro on Wilson Pond and soon they had hydropower. And soon it was actually more than the fossil fueled power. You know, again, more and more people were tuning into electricity. It's kind of like the internet in the 90s. You know, everybody wanted a piece of the action. Demand kept growing. And um, the Keene Gas and Electric Company was formed. And they first built a power line over to the new Vernon Dam on the Connecticut River. They eventually built lines over to Peterborough and Dublin. They created this, this mini grid. And, and then there was drought, but by having the mini grid, the different plants could be dispatched and keep all the lights on. And it was really kind of an amazing localized grid, which many people fantasize about today. Well, over hundred years ago, they were doing it. Um, but demand kept growing and they wanted more and more electricity. So the people at King Gas and Electric scouted around in the hills and they found this really neat site in the hills in Marlborough, New Hampshire. And they secretly sort of bought up the mill rights because there are a bunch of little mills along the stream. This is sort of parallel to the Rockefellers buying up all the land that became Grand Teton National Park. You, know, you don't tell anybody what you're doing, but they bought up all the mill sites and then they built this incredible new power plant, which at the time was the biggest in the county and ran the entire county. It was called Miniwawa for the brook that it's on. And it was quite bold. It involves a big arch dam, which nobody had seen an arch dam in the Eastern United States at that time. It involved, involved a pipeline to carry the water, which was over a mile long and it was about yay big, four feet in diameter, and was made of redwood staves from California. So the whole thing was just, it was a really aggressive project. And they did it, and it worked, and it went online in 1923 and ran until 1968. Um, like so many small hydro plants built in that time, you know, it eventually met its demise because fossil fuel became much cheaper and the plants much bigger. So. I think what we'll do now is, let's see. Oh yeah, so by the time the mid forties came around, there are a bunch of utility companies involved, public service of New Hampshire had come on the scene and um, they were all building hydro. And by the mid forties, hydropower provided about 95% of the electric grid. So it was really, you know, it was the reign of hydropower. And then, you know, in 1948, there was a big report that came out saying we're running out of water, like in New England. And, and this was really when fossil fuel started to ramp up. And as it did, as I said, the, the smaller plants were, were sort of forgotten and dropped off the grid. Um, and it was really only with the passage of PURPA many years later that the small plants started coming back. And again, that's when I was a kid and I was sort of watching all this happen. And I thought, wow, this is fabulous. I want to be a part of this. And that's how I got into hydro. So today in New England, and I'm gonna talk about mostly the New England grid, but occasionally I'll dabble in national and international energy issues. Um, today, hydro is about, local hydro is about seven and a half percent of our, our grid power. Um, Canadian hydro brings in another 8% or so, and then we have pump storage for one or 2%. So overall hydro is about 18% of, of the New England grid, which is twice all the other renewables combined, just for point of reference. Um, the rest of the grid is, you know, a quarter of its nuke, 50% is natural gas. And obviously we're trying to wind down the gas and replace it with renewables. On the positive note, coal and oil are now less than 1% of the New England grid. So we made great progress uh, as far as that goes. Um, so hydro, you know, both small and large, it's, it's clean as far as there are no emissions when you're generating it. It's 18% of the grid, it's an important part. It 
the bigger hydro plants allow storage, which is going to be more and more important as they have more and more intermittent solar and wind online. Um, pump storage in particular, you know, where you pump the water uphill at night and run it back down in the daytime is going to be particularly important. Although today, having talked to the general manager of the biggest storage battery in New England, which is the Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Plant, he says they can hardly make any money because the way the pricing structure is set up, there's not enough price differential between night and day. So, you know, just one more example of where we need policy tweaks to make the system work better. Um, and of course, I, I can't give this talk without mentioning Canadian hydro, which, as I said, is about half of our hydropower in New England. It is Canadian. And of course, there's talk of bringing a lot more Canadian hydropower down. Canadian hydro has gigantic environmental impacts. Any big dam does. You know, at some point, you have to decide, you know, what the balance is. Is it worth it? You know, do we dam every river? In my opinion, certainly not. You know, we must preserve some wild rivers, but hydropower does offer clean energy and it offers storage at scale. Um, so most of you know who Annie Custer is, our, our representative from District 2 in New Hampshire. Annie uh, embarked on a dam bill about a year ago. She calls it the 21st Century Dams Act. And it's really quite excellent. It's quite innovative. It involves what she calls the three R's, retrofitting, in which you add hydroelectric capacity to existing non-powered dams, mostly big flood control dams, rehab, where you're rehabilitating existing hydroelectric sites that are you know, worn out or failing, and removal where you remove dams that aren't serving any obvious purpose, but are impending fish passage. So um, I've been working with her on that a little bit. And uh, in fact, we just had a big Zoom session with Senator Hassan a few days ago, also working on the language for the three R's bill. I, I think it's really unusual and bold because it does acknowledge you know, both the benefits of hydro and the fact that free rivers are also great things. And consequently, the bill has drawn the support of disparate groups like the National Hydro Association and American Rivers and Natural Resources Defense Council, you know, all sides are agreeing on this bill, which is kind of an amazing thing. Um, I think it's a good time to look at some photos, some slides. All right. So Sean, you, you good for this? I think we're gonna have the all post on. <laughs> I got here an hour early to work out the technical issues. As soon as I got here, it's a half an hour drive from home. I realized, oh, I forgot my talk. So all my notes, I didn't have any of this. So Sean got the technology figured out and I had no speech, but luckily a neighbor emailed us the speech a few minutes ago. I have my little laser pointer. There's Andy Custer. Most of you know our representative and me and a few other. Tom Kiernan here is the president of American Rivers. And this is all part of this 21st Century Dams Act we're working on. We had a you know press event at Wilder Dam on the Connecticut River. Okay, next. Quick, quick diagram, I realized you know, I'm not really talking much about the engineering of these things, but I, I think most of you know how a hydro plant works. You know, you got water up above the dam, somehow it gets down to the powerhouse, flows through a turbine, spins a generator, and goes out the tail race. Very simple. Okay, next. This is my first hydroelectric project that I built. It's in northeastern Connecticut. Uh, it was a flagship of Connecticut Light and Power in the 20s and 30s. And then, of course, it fell into disrepair. Um, I had just traveled around the world and spent a lot of time in Africa uh, before I came home and bought this plant and rebuilt it. And the travels in Africa gave me great insight into creating something out of nothing. I mean, where we traveled in Africa, there's very little money, very little material wealth or material anything, and yet people got by. And this building this plant with essentially no money was all about getting by. So it's, it's built of pieces I dragged out of junkyards and pulled out of the woods and just, you know, it's, it's really a cob job, and yet in the end, it works great, and it's still generating today. So it, you know, it did take some work, but um, I financed it in part, you know, on a credit card. And my dear sister Sally made loaned me some money, which I did pay back, and um, and I I got a lot of cheap labor because every few weeks we'd have a work party where my friends from Boston and New York, you know, would drive up in their fancy little cars because they all have professional jobs in the city and they'd come up in their dirty clothes and we would just sling mud and pour concrete and cut steel and you know clear brush all weekend long and then have a, a dance party at night to yeah. have some fun so a lot of free labor went into this thing okay next <clears throat> what? 
This is a uh oh, it froze no, up. We're okay. It's just there we go. This is the plant we own on the Westfield River in Western Massachusetts, and I feature it only because it's got this incredible fish passage system using a Deniel fish ladder, which which moves uh, eels and shad, and it used to move salmon. Unfortunately, salmon are not doing well. Next, use the shad passing through the fish counting house at the fish ladder. Uh, you know, some years we'll have 30,000 shad. It's quite amazing. Next. Same plant. This is my son Van and me, and we are installing the exciter on the top of this big generator. And if anybody wonders what an exciter is, I, I could go into that later. Um, but this generator, this whole plant was built in 1926. And one of the things I love about hydro is it is really old, simple, and yet super efficient technology. It is the most efficient way to generate electricity by far at, at about 90% for a setup like this. So very efficient, very rugged. Again, this machine is 98 years old. Next. Here's the nameplate from a generator we have up in Claremont, Joe, your hometown, 1909. Okay, so over 100 years old. Next. Oops. Whoops. We also like modern stuff. This is the mini Wawa plant, which I described a little bit earlier, and now we own it. And this is the Tesla parked outside of it charging. And, you know, yeah, we have computers that run all the plants and everything. So it's kind of a mix of, of old and new, uh, but that, that keeps it interesting. Next. So again, this is still mini Wawa, the plant in Marlboro, New Hampshire, that used to run all of Cheshire County. And when we bought it, the dam was in a deep state of decay. And the dam is now 98 years old, so it has a good reason to be tired. But uh, a, a project like this is heavily regulated by the federal government, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in particular. And for years, they had sort of been, I don't know, harassing the previous owner, asking him to do endless studies of the dam and how safe it was and how strong it was. And we were tired of the studies and we just said, let's rebuild it. So we did. Next, we rebuilt the whole thing. It took three summers. Big project, biggest construction project we've probably undertaken, um, in which we chipped off, you know, feet of concrete and added many feet of new concrete. Okay, next. One of our hardworking guys, uh, Alex, is a ski bum in Jackson Hole in the winter, and in the summer he would come help us pour concrete. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, there's the finished product. Again, three summers, great project, and now. The feds are still asking us to do studies. <laughs> uh, next. So this is up in Claremont. And I had eyeballed these projects for years and years. I knew they were fallow. They, they were existing, but not operating. And finally, we struck a deal with the owner of this project. And in nine months, we got it back online. And uh, that's the beautiful Sugar River. This is one thing I love about hydro is you're always in these pretty settings. Um, next. This is just a quick review of what we went through trying to get that plant back online. This is the, the turbine runner, the heart of the turbine, the part that spins before we fixed it. And it was missing parts. It was corroded. It was a mess. Next. But we sent it to the original shop in Canada where it was built. And that's how it came back two months later. Next. And that's the guide vane case that feeds water into that turbine, also rebuilt in Canada. <clears throat> Next. And a couple of the, the lads putting the new turbine back together. Next. Okay. A couple, three very interesting people here. Uh, this is one of my partners, Tim Taylor, sitting in the excavator, and another partner, Sam Payne. Sam spent most of his life as a professional acrobat. And uh, look at his arms. This guy is wicked strong. And that's from being in circus his whole life. But also, he's, he's a linchpin of our company now as a newer partner. He's probably the youngest and strongest, and he works his tail off. And my daughter, Nina, who she and my son, Ben, would occasionally come on the job site and help us out. Next. OK, we're going to jump to the international scene. And the, these are all pictures I've taken in my travels. And I mentioned earlier, we were in Africa, my sister Sally and I and my dear friend Charlie. And this is as close as we got to probably the biggest hydroelectric potential site in Africa. This, this is in the Congo, this is the Congo River. And this is the port city of Matadi. But 
just a, upstream from here is the Inga Rapids. And um, the Congo and, and its tributaries represent 13% of the world's untapped hydro potential. And all they've really built there is a fairly small plant at the Inga Rapids. And because it's the Congo and corrupt and war-torn, sadly, the, the hydro plant has fallen into disrepair. But it's this, it's this gigantic site. It's 40 gigawatts is the potential, which is twice the size of Three Gorges in China, which is right now the biggest hydro site in the world. So I mention it just to give you a sense of scale. Um, next. And this is Mosi Otunya, or Victoria Falls, if you prefer, on the Zambezi River, on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia, where we also went. And my sister and Charlie and I went there to, to obviously enjoy the, the beauty of the falls. And I didn't even know until you know, days later that there's an operating hydroelectric plant there that generates something like 100 megawatts. But nobody even knows about it because there's no dam and they don't take all the water and they just operate it, you know, in sync with the waterfall. So it's very low impact hydro and yet it's, it's a big plant. Incidentally, the same thing happens at Niagara Falls. There's a huge hydro plant there, but they leave plenty of water to go over the falls. Next. Okay, so then we were traveling in the Amazon and stumbled on this, this giant thing. This is a Tukuri Dam on the Tocantins River. And again, my buddy Charlie and I were, were traveling here and you know we were just kind of hitchhiking into town and then because i'm a hydro guy i went and knocked on the door and you know they let us in and this is <laughs> this is pre 9 11 of course uh, <laughs> but next slide um and you know this is the inside of that place and just again sense of scale we're talking the amazon we're talking brazil everything is gigantic this plant is eight times the, the size of hoover dam so it's just wow. gigantic it was the biggest project in the amazon at the time and again because it's gigantic, it has huge environmental impacts. And that's how I first heard about it, is reading in the New York Times, you know, about all the environmental impacts of this thing. So again, when you build things like this, you are making some huge bets on, you know, what it's going to do to the ecosystem versus how much carbon it's going to save. So never an easy choice. Next. Uh, this is up in the Himalayas, and we visited a little funky hydro site in the beautiful region of Ladakh in Northeast India. Next. And we were prospecting for hydro in the jungles of Nicaragua, where this is. And next, we found this beautiful site. Um, we, we never did anything with it, but, but it was a lot of fun looking for sites. Next. OK, so now we're down in Patagonia in southern Chile. And uh, I've always been interested in Chile, and so has my wife. We both traveled there separately before we even knew each other. But come to find out there was a whole utility company for sale in Southern Chile. And it was a very small utility. It covered a vast area, but the population density is so low that it didn't, uh, it wasn't a very big utility and the state was privatizing it. And I got together with a friend and, and teamed up with a small Chilean power company and we put in a bid to buy it. We didn't get it, but in the process, we got to tour all their facilities and their, their whole shtick was to shut down their diesel and replace it all with clean energy, hydro and wind and solar. So it was really a fascinating project. Um, and this, whoops, this project was, this, this turbine, you know, again, really old, built by the Pelton Company in San Francisco and, and exported to Chile. Next. Okay, another export from Chile, uh, from San Francisco to Chile is this man, Doug Tompkins, a, a fascinating man and one of the world's greatest unknown conservationists. And this is a sidebar I'm going off on people. Um, my wife and I wanted to take our honeymoon in Chile in 1995, and we were sort of planning it. And we opened the New York Times Magazine one day and read, you know, like an eight page story about this guy, Doug Tompkins, and what he was doing in Chile. And what he had done by the time we found out about him was he purchased 750,000 acres, uh, which Literally, his land bisected Chile because his land ran from the Argentine border to the Pacific Ocean. And he was doing it all to create wilderness preserves. And my wife and I are really into wilderness. And we just thought, this is incredible. And on top of that, he, he expressed in this article that we read that you know, he wanted to make the little villages that were already there sustainable and you know, set them up with green energy and organic gardening and all these things. And, and we just thought, wow, this is incredible. We want to go there anyway. Let's write him a letter. And so I did. And I said, oh, I'm a hydro engineer. And if you have any interest in hydropower, you know, in your little villages, let me know. And, you know, of course, I didn't think anything would come of it. And this was 
you know, pre-internet and I couldn't get an address. I just sent it to Wien House, which is his office in Puerto Montt, Chile. You know, two months later, I get this beautiful postcard back of the Andes Mountains covered in snow and it's from his wife, Chris. And it says, oh, glad you're coming down to Chile. Why don't you pay our office a visit and we'll talk about turbines in the rivers, she said. So that was our ticket in. Um, and we went down there and, and sure enough, you know, we, we met these amazing conservationists and one thing led to another and we became good friends. And years later, I was helping them install hydro. And this is a powerhouse I designed and built um, at the little village of Pion in what is now called Douglas Tompkins Pumalin National Park. Okay, next, that's the turbina that we installed actually made in Washington state. Next, <clears throat> and this is Doug and Chris and my wife Annie and me on their, well, on Doug's runway with their volcano in the background. Um, next. And another thing that the Tompkins were doing in Chile, uh, and this, you know, this just sort of, this expanded my horizons on, on hydropower and environmentalism, but this is in deep Southern Chile. And this is the giant Baker or Baker River. And this is a wild part of the country. There's very little going on, very lightly populated, you know, a great place for national parks and wilderness. Well, a big power company in Spain wanted to dam all the rivers down there and export the energy up the spine of the Andes to Santiago and to the copper mines up north. And Doug and his team of environmentalists just thought this was crazy and they fought this thing tooth and nail. And I, and I agree with them. It, this, you know, use solar power up in the desert to run your copper smelters. This was a crazy project and Doug fought it next. And they fought it in many ways, including these funny billboards that say, Paragonia sin represas, which means without dams. And they show you horrible pictures of power lines in front of all the beautiful mountains and such. And they won. They got the power company to back down. The, the president of Chile you know, joined, joined them and said, you're right. We shouldn't destroy this pristine area. Next. Similarly, in Costa Rica, we, we went there a while ago and we're doing some rafting on the Pacuare River. And um, next. Right at this spot in the rafting journey, the guide told us, oh, this is where they wanted to build a giant arch dam. But again, the government of, of Costa Rica, where they get 98% of their energy from renewables and, and about 90% of that is hydro, uh, they, they exhibited restraint. You know, they said a wild river, you know, yes, ecotourism, but a wild river is more important than yet another dam. So they exhibited restraint and we were just so impressed by that. Next. And this is taking restraint one step further. This is the what's left of the Glines Canyon Dam on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. And I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but this, this was on the Elwha River, which drains mostly the Olympic National Park. And it's almost the entire drainage basin is pristine wilderness and is protected in the national park. And there were two dams at the head of the, at the base of the river where it meets the sea. And you know, it took many years to negotiate this, but eventually they were bought out and the dams were taken out. And now you have a, a wild free flowing river once again. And it's you know, teeming with, I'm not sure about which species, but I've read that it's a really remarkable um, restoration story. So you know, I'm a dam guy, but I, I think it's pretty cool when something like this happens. I happen to have a sample of concrete from Glines Canyon Dam. Um, <laughs> because we, we actually had to break in to explore the place because it was all fenced for, for the construction, but I'm quite proud of my little sample of concrete. Um, where are we next? Okay, jumping back to New England. Well, this was just one of those storms that we had in July. So five and a half inches of rain. And my point of this is that small hydropower is kind of like right in the crosshairs of climate change. So it's pretty strange because we are both Part of the solution, in my opinion, but we're also taking it hard from climate change. So when we get this kind of flooding, it is just murder on our, on our power plants. Next. Um, so what we're doing, this is one of our dams on the lower Schwelet River, which I mentioned earlier, and we're literally cutting the top off the dam with a diamond saw. And we're doing this to create more area to pass more flood flows because the floods are so much more vicious and, and so, so much more frequent. Next. That's a piece of dam we're peeling off. And we kept going, we took all this off. Next. And another thing we're doing is taking away these wooden flashboards 
which used to be on the crest of the dam to build a little extra head or height. And they kept failing because of the frequent floods and we're replacing them with steel panels on hinges that are pushed up with airbags. And it's, it's a very expensive system, but you know, it's, it's one of the external costs of climate change for us. Next. And this is at the site in Claremont, one of the two sites. And similarly here, we decided we had to cut off top of the dam to create more flood passage. So here we are this summer with the guys in with their diamond saws cutting all the concrete. But before we could even lift the concrete blocks out, next, we got a flood. <laughs> and, and so the flood pushed these blocks and some of these weigh seven tons um, and knocked them right off the dam. And of course they crushed our scaffold. You know, this all happened in a big flood so nobody was there to get hurt, but, but it, it was quite a mess. Um, okay, next. <clears throat> And this is my last slide. And just to, this is, you know, sunrise on the Ashwilat, the lower Ashwilat River at one of our plants, but reminding me of one of the major reasons I love being in this industry is because it's just, you're always outdoors in a beautiful place along a beautiful river, hopefully. So good. Okay, lights please. Okay, so we are in the midst of a climate crisis, of course, and over in Glasgow, if you ask Greta Thunberg, you know, the people in the COP26 conference hall are making no progress at all. And they're certainly not making as, pro as much progress as they should. Um, so for the time being, you know, I think we kind of have to think more regionally about the progress that we're gonna make. And in, in fact, in New, e New England, we are making good progress. Um, I'm gonna refer to some, some numbers coming out of the ISO New England. ISO is the independent system operator, which is the great black box that runs the grid in New England. Um, and there are humans inside the box, but they're kind of hard to get to. So instead we get all this data coming out and we kind of learn about how the grid works. Um, some interesting trends. In the last 10 years, energy efficiency and behind the meter solar and load management have risen 25X just a huge increase in all these good positive trends on the grid. Um, energy, efficiency, energy efficiency itself is cutting 200 megawatts of load off the grid each year, 14% uh, off the peak. We're, we're spending a billion dollars a year on energy efficiency in New England, which is fabulous, and we should be. We should be spending more, actually. Of course, Massachusetts leads in all these efforts, and guess which state is last, <laughs> of course. Um, and, and of course, the, the reason people are spending so much money is in part because states are offering programs to mandate, to not necessarily mandate, but to incent these things. And of course, this is why New Hampshire is dead last is because our programs were very thin to begin with and some of them have been scuttled. Um, so even with electric vehicles coming online and heat pumps coming online, which is where we need to move if we're gonna clean up our grid, the ISO still thinks that we're really not going to grow very much, which is great news. The, the grid is, over the next 10 years, is projected to grow at only about 1% when you account for all these different things I just mentioned. Um, and perhaps even more interesting, when you look at the generation that's in the mix, that's ready to come online, it's called the Generation Q. And these are the plants that are all planned and ready to be built, but they're not built yet. And when I gave this similar talk maybe five years ago, last time I did this, which is why I'm rusty, um, the, the Q was 66% gas, you know, more natural gas fired plants, cleaner than coal, but still e emitting greenhouse gases, 66% gas and 33% wind. Today, it's 61% wind and 8% gas. So another great positive trend. And, and these aren't, you know, just hippies putting up little windmills. This is Goldman Sachs and all the big guys saying we are doing offshore wind. So that is the future of New England. Um, the Generation Q is also about 20% solar and 10% battery storage, which is great because we need more storage. Um, so who's, who's kind of leading in all this nationwide and what do we need to do to, to make it all happen faster? California is leading in solar at 31% of their grid. Uh, Iowa is leading in wind at 41%. You know, even Oklahoma, James Inhofe and those guys, 31% uh, wind. Washington State is the green energy leader of the nation at 76%. That's because they have so much hydro. Um, and China leads in wind internationally. And India is 
almost going to lead in solar, but of course they're both still addicted to coal. So China and India are a mixed bag, but they're moving in the right direction. Norway is another one of these countries that's 99% hydro powered and they're leading in every way. I just read that they're expecting the last gasoline powered car to be sold, new car to be sold in April of 2022 and they're done. You know, they're already the best market for, for Tesla's for example, in the world per capita. Um, so that all sounds like good news. You know, those are New England trends, again, in large part driven by Massachusetts policy, but all the states are doing it. And incidentally, I should say, policies that are promoted by nonprofit groups like the Conservation, Conservation Law Foundation, which, which I'm a part of. Um, but clearly we need to do more and we need to do it faster. So today, the policies in New England that, that sort of control a lot of this energy development are, are a mixed bag, sort of a mishmash of, there's a renewable portfolio standard, uh, there's net metering, you know, there are direct grants, um, voluntary programs as carbon trading. And some of these are working quite well. I, I helped Molly Kelly, Senator Molly Kelly, rewrite the net metering statute several years ago. And since then, solar and small hydro have really done much better um, at a small scale. It took a while to, to uprate the net metering and that only happened recently. But as I said, that, that's kind of a mishmash of many different regulations and programs, which in my opinion, you know, it's, it's kind of inefficient. Um, what would be so much simpler and sort of the libertarian solution would be to have an open access electric grid where you know anybody can participate and you get paid real-time costs for energy because the prices are always changing and you'd have a tremendous price on carbon and that's really what we need more than anything is a big price on carbon you know we've got joe biden's administration you know calling it 51 dollars a ton that we need as a price some environmental groups are calling for 150 dollars a ton um, but that's what we need is a price on carbon, and then the chips can fall where they will. But, you know, I think that would be the biggest single thing we do to start really moving at scale on climate change. Um, there's one group I want to call out because two of their members are here, Joel and Ann Huberman, and that's the Citizens Climate Lobby, a fantastic group that's working to pass federal legislation on carbon fee and dividend. And of course, we don't call it a tax, it's a fee, and it really doesn't act like a tax because most of the money in carbon fee and dividend, or maybe all of it, is given back to the American people on a per capita basis. So um, in the end, it obviously provides a huge disincentive to using carbon-based fuels, but at the end of the day, people are made whole. So uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, um, if people want to get in touch with Joel Huberman, his email address is joel. H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N at gmail.com. Thanks, Joel. Um, but that, you know, carbon fee and dividend, got to have it, got to have some price on carbon, but it is going to take a while at the federal level. So in the short term, I think we should continue to support net metering and the renewable portfolio standard. And we should encourage our towns, cities, businesses to, you know, purchase as much green power as they can to adopt community power statutes, which is a little more involved, but it's, it's a good way to go. And there are new laws in New Hampshire making it possible. Um, one thing that community power can do besides buying green is it can help incent energy efficiency, which ultimately is even more important than renewable energy. We just plain need to use a lot less energy. So um, over in Keene, we, we sort of have an ongoing program to help consent and finance public and nonprofit buildings that are going through major retrofits to you know, basically add more insulation. And it's actually been quite challenging because it's just not sexy. You know, it's solar panels are kind of neat. You can brag about them. You can see them, you know, more insulation in the walls. It's just, it's not sexy, but we keep pushing it. Everybody needs to push it. We need to keep working on energy efficiency as the number one tool in the climate crisis. Um, well, I'm gonna wander off script a little bit and, and wrap this up so we can have Q and A um, by sort of going back to the, the Tompkins that I told you about, the, the amazing people we met in Chile. Doug Tompkins tragically died a few years ago in a kayaking accident. And uh, Chris, his wife, sort of you know, after a period of mourning, basically shifted into high gear and, <laughs> 
took all the lands that they bought in, in the South and donated them to the governments of Argentina and Chile. And in the process leveraged the creation of 14 million acres of wild national parks. And, and you know, just the scale of that, it's phenomenal. But I come back to them because when Annie and I spent a lot of time with them, we sort of, you know, our worldview expanded a bit. And although our parents had really already given us the foundation of sort of environmental thinking, which I think we have, these guys, the Tompkins, took it to a whole new level. And I just want to try to share a little bit of that with you because it's it's the part of this whole talk where I don't feel like even if we put solar on every rooftop and windmills, you know, here and there and hydro and whatnot, you know, we're still not going to solve some of the major problems of the day, like the extinction crisis. Okay, I mean, we're humans are pushing ecosystems towards the sixth extinction, and you know, who are we to do this? What gives us the right to do this? Uh, you know, nobody, nothing does. And to arrest it, it, I feel like we need to sort of throttle back on the whole human experiment. And how we do this, I don't exactly know, but I do know that, well, I have, I have a couple of great quotes I'd like to read um, from a, a pretty deep thinker named Eileen Christ, who's a professor at Virginia Tech, a professor of science and society, I think she called herself. Um, uh, where are they hidden? Ah, oh, here it is. And I mean, what I'm getting at is the climate crisis is not really the root cause, it's a symptom. And so Eileen Chris says, extolling the merits of solar and wind and, and hydro is fine, but it's nothing compared to creating a downsized, mindful material culture that is locally and regionally oriented. So, you know, just kind of looking at population growth and material consumption and all of that and saying, gee, maybe we're headed in the wrong direction. Um, one more strand that I left dangling, that guy, Peter Evans, 1716, he and Steve Belden built that little mill and they had to maintain it forever. Did you ever wonder what happened? <laughs> well, Peter had a son, Lieutenant John Evans, who had a son, Uriel, who had a son, Columbus, who had a son, John, who had a son, Kareel, who had a son, Frederick, who had a daughter, Elizabeth, who had a son, Robert. And that's me, Robert Evans King. <laughs> So Peter Evans can rest in peace knowing that the water mills in the lower Shwilet are still being maintained. <laughs> okay, with that, I will attempt to field your questions. And I don't know, Sean, do you want to tell the Zoom people how to do it? Well, yeah, so the Zoom people should uh, type their um, questions into chat, but there's one already, which is that you gave a um, uh, email address and I'll type it in for them. Oh, good. What was it? Can we go on gallery so we can see everybody? Uh, yep, we can do that. And let me just get this email address and I'll put that. J O E L. J O E L, yep. Dot H U B E R M A N. Yep. At gmail.com. At gmail.com. And that's Joel right there. Those folks. And then I'll, I'll put this on gallery so that they're not. Okay. Well, we have. Over 30 people, and I'm hoping we're going on to Zoom. see them all. Uh, or, yes, well, there they are now. So, folks at home, you are on the big screen in the civic. Yes, uh, for those of you online, uh, we are looking at a large screen. Feel free to turn on your video. And given the number of people, I think it makes sense if you use the chat line. I'm going to begin with those who are here and who wants the first question yes go ahead and stand up and speak loudly pick up your mask so we can hear you so my, my question is a little periphery but there was a main vote just uh, yes a couple weeks ago yes where they voted against supporting the transmission yes how about that bring hydro, hydro power to this area indeed what's the impact on your industry and how does it respond and is this a sustainable just, my God, that answer could go on for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Just repeat or summarize the question. Okay. The question is, is about the, I think it's called Clean Energy Connect uh, transmission line across Maine that was just voted down 
in a referendum. Um, and for, first of all, just to be clear, Bob, my industry, I consider to be small hydropower and small and large hydro are very different animals. And while I'm a hydromaniac regarding all hydro, what I sort of relish and spend my days on is small hydro. Um, and as I said in, in my talk, Canadian hydro is important, and but I think it, we need to have limits on it. Like we but can't develop every darn can't, river. If they can't transmit that power, you can't build that line. Yeah. What impact does that have in New Hampshire? Almost none in New Hampshire. The, a lot of that energy, maybe 100% of it, and there are people on that screen who could answer better, but maybe 100% of that energy was bound for Massachusetts. So it was a big part of their clean energy yeah. plan. So it's a big setback for them. You know, the, as you probably read, that case is gonna now go to court. Um, you know, in New Hampshire, we fought Northern Pass, which was another big power line for Hydro-Quebec and we beat it back. And I say we, cause I'm on the side that fought against it. I, the, the main power line was probably a much better plan. I mean, it, it didn't cut through much wilderness. I don't know if it cut through any and it was mostly using existing rights of way. So it was a better plan. So, you know, it's too bad that, that it was stopped. Uh, it might not be dead yet. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the chat line. Oh, okay. I, can, I can actually put the chat line up here so you can see it. Well, that would the be chat good. people are quite active, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see, so George Preston asked, he was the first to ask, he said, okay. When and how uh, will we enjoy the benefits of hydropower on the Ashwila right there at Granite Gorge? Are there any are there other river projects in the works in our region? When and how will we enjoy the benefits <clears throat> of hydropower on the Ashwila right there at Granite Gorge? Are there other river projects in the works in our region? So George, good question. It, it would be very hard to develop a project at Granite Gorge if it was gonna require a dam because it's just very hard to place a new dam these days for environmental reasons and probably good reasons. Um, so you're not likely to see any hydropower there. You know, you might someday see hydropower at uh, either of the two flood control dams outside of Keene, which one of which is on the main stem of the Ashwilet. Um, that's, that's something that a lot of people are looking at. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite is happening. The very first dam on the lower Shwilek might be coming out in, 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 in order to assist fish migrating upstream. So that, that, but again, that's a big story in itself. So I'll just leave it at that. All right, in the room, who has the next? Yes, maybe take off the max. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, Bob, about your projection. I realize it's gonna have to be a very vague projection what proportion of New Hampshire's total energy needs in 2050 will be provided by small hydropower? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a pretty small number, but what I often say in answer to that question, it would be a much bigger number if the overall size of the grid came down. So, <laughs> and then when you add in larger, local hydropower and then Hydro-Quebec, you know, the number gets even bigger, like over 20%. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then, you know, it's possible that new hydro pump storage will be built if it's closed cycle, i.e. if it doesn't draw off a river, because that's going to be controversial. But if you build closed loop pump storage, you know, you could call that hydro, but um, that, that could still happen. Thanks. Bob, uh, from the chat line, what can you tell us about the balancing act between wild rivers and hydro dams? Well, it's, I don't know, it's a tough balancing act. And, you know, there are those of us who, who love both, both wild rivers and hydro dams. I, I tried to show on my slides how, you know, countries like Costa Rica and Chile have exhibited restraint and both those countries get a lot of their energy, Costa Rica, almost all their electrical energy from hydro. And yet they're also showing restraint at leaving some of their rivers wild. So, you know, I, I guess that's all I can say when, you know, it often comes down to pitched battles over each and every river and each and every dam. So um, it would be nice if, you know, countries like Canada could simply say, well, we're done. You know, we're done with that. We've developed whatever, 30,000 megawatts of hydro, that's enough. And now we have to learn to live with that amount of power that we have. In the room. 
All right, well, then we'll go back to the chat line. And the question is, what additional small hydro capacity realistically develops, developable do you think there is in New England? Well, <clears throat> not a whole lot. And it's partly because of that hydro gold rush I described in the 70s and 80s, which, which soaked up a lot of it. Uh, a lot of those plants did later fall apart because the investors didn't know what they were doing. So there is sort of a sub industry rehabilitating the rehabilitated dams and hydros, um, but there aren't many new sites other than at, at, at big flood control dams. And, and the percentage there is gonna be pretty small. I just wondering, is McDowell Dam in uh, uh, Peterborough? Peter are they still generating electricity at all? Well, there are two active hydro sites just below McDowell Dam. Yeah. They're running. They're running. Yep. How about Otter Brook? Well, when you say Otter Brook, do you at the Otter Brook flood, flood control dam? Yeah. There's no hydro there, but that is one of the sites outside of Keene I was referring to that possibly could be developed could be for hydro. Yeah. Huge yeah. Yeah. Bob, uh, uh, it seems this is Mark Neiser to everyone. It seems like there is a tough balance between hydro good and hydro bad. How do you find the balance between environmental damage and clean energy? How do we find that balance? Is there a leather suit jacket? How do I get one? Mark, Mark, it's all about juggling. Mark Neiser is a professional juggler, people. Um, <laughs> I actually feel like I answered that question already, but <laughs> you know, it, yeah. How do you strike the balance? There, there, there's no easy way. It's gonna be case specific. You know, I mean, some rivers are de in this country are declared wild and scenic. And at that point, you know, those rivers are safe from guys like me, which I think is a great thing. Um, that's kind of how it's gonna play out on a river by river basis. In the room, so, yes. Yeah, I'd like to you want to stand up and take it off. Yeah, sure. um, I'd like to take the argument about you know good bad to the international side because not only are there environmental concerns, there are political concerns. And I would bring up the new dam that Ethiopia just built, and there's talk of war right. between Ethiopia and Egypt. So how do you balance that when you have water needs in one country that affect the water supply, potentially affect the water supply of another country? Good question coming from a State Department fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Retired. Um, yeah, I can't believe that story that, you know, they're just going to slowly fill up that dam with the waters of the Nile. And, and, and it's not know. isolated because yeah. you have Turkey damming uh, the Tigris and Euphrates that potentially affect the water level in Baghdad. Yeah. Bob, I could say it's beyond my pay grade to answer that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could. Well, I just want to bring up that, that, that hydropower has more consequences oh, of than course. environmental consequences. Yeah, absolutely. On a, well, on a big scale, on a macro scale, yeah. have political implications. And a great example of that is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the late dictator Mobutu Sese Seko used the electricity from the Yenga Shaba Dam project as political leverage. He'd shut off circuits if people weren't behaving. I mean, sure, it's a good point. Sean. Um, it, it seems like here, it, right in Jaffrey, you know, we have a lot of dams that used to be mill dams. And I've often heard that the sort of perpetuity part of like it will be maintained often falls on the landowner. And that's why it's so difficult to remove them or do anything with them because they sort of can be really tied up in kind of uh, ancient easements. And is that true? Is it, is, are these are, are all these dams like highly legally bound and that's why it's so hard to do anything with them? The real estate is very complicated. And I'm, I'm reminded of a friend of mine in Massachusetts who runs a land trust and uh -huh. they were given a dam and an impoundment uh -huh. and told to conserve it. And and one thing they were interested in doing is taking the dam out. But right. then they quickly found that all these different landowners who abutted the reservoir didn't want to take it out. So, 
you know, it's it's very complicated just because reservoirs are usually fairly large and have multiple landowners on them. Uh, um, you know, the dam itself, whoever owns it, presumably has the right to do what they want with it. But you know, if you're going to put it in hydro, you've got to spend three or four or five years getting permits. Uh, and if you're going to take it out, you spend almost as much time getting permits, wow. and you have to convince all the neighbors that losing their reservoir is okay. So right. it's it is complicated. Brad Carpenter, uh, sorry, Brad Campbell tells us that Bob King, who has, if nothing else, shown us that he knows what he's talking about, uh, is the New Hampshire chair of the Conservation Law Foundation, and. If people are interested in knowing more about New England's energy challenges, he recommends going to their website, which is clf.org. Uh, question from George Preston Bob. Oh, I Wasn't thought we did there a huge this. hydro project oh. on the Pentuco River in Hillsborough that was going to put much of Stoddard underwater? Can you tell us a little about that? I don't know the specifics, George. I think you're going back, you know, 80 years or something. But, but those types of projects were planned for a lot of rivers in this area. I'm familiar with one on the lower Ashwilet that would have submerged, you know, a quarter of Winchester and Hinsdale. And those were all proposed generally by New England Power, you know, in the 20s and 30s, when they were really going nuts on on water power. So yeah, that's that's never going to happen. Will Fleming, what is the average lifespan of a new hydro plant versus one that has been rebuilt? And is there a preference between the two in terms of environmental impact? Oh, okay. The first part of the question. I think we're just going into the weeds here. Well, that's okay. Uh, I'm an engineer. I love the weeds. Um, I mean, the first part of the question, Will, uh, the lifespan really depends who built it and if they knew what they were doing. And some of the older plants, like that plant in Claremont, I showed you the nameplate from 1909. You know, that plant is doing fine. And the generators are original and the turbines have been rebuilt, but you know, that plant's doing fine. The other plant in Claremont that we own was built in 1995 and promptly fell apart. So, um, you know, it, generally the older, the older equipment is, is gonna be better. Um, the second part of your question was a little more nuanced about the environmental impact. Uh, you know, a, a dam's a dam and has kind of a similar environmental impact, but this is a good time to point out that a, a development can be made much lower impact if you don't build a big dam in the first place. So for example, you know, back to the Congo at these Inga Rapids, they could probably generate thousands of megawatts without even building a dam, just by building a diversion, you know, maybe three feet tall, and scooting off maybe 10% of the water into a canal to, you know, to generate power. So you can do hydropower, even large scale hydropower without tremendous environmental, environmental impact if you're willing to give up a lot and not build to the max, which is often what engineers want to do. Jack? Yes. Yeah. I, I have heard of something called run of the river, which uh, is also supposed to uh, produce electricity without a dam. Could, could you explain that to us? Yeah, that's not quite the whole story, Joel. Run of River describes almost all the small hydro in New England. And it, they often do have dams, but what it means is the operator cannot use the dam as a battery. You can't run the water level up and down to, to meet demand. You can only use the water that's coming in that the rain has given you, and that's all you can use. So you have to equalize your outflow with your inflow. That's what Run of River means. Um, Back online, uh, this is interesting. Elizabeth King, is that a relative? That's my sister. Ah, <laughs> well, your sister. I'm Betsy. <laughs> that the first alliance of independent Greek poly states was to respect water rights of each member seventh century before the common era. How about that? Is she right? Well, she lives in Athens, so she <laughs> ought to be. Well, then she would not. Uh, has PERPA, that's the Jimmy Carter law, yes, yes. remained intact or has it grown or shrunk over the years? It's intact. It's intact. Um, 
the, the big energy bill during the, the Bush years changed it. And I can't remember exactly how, but it, it is intact and anybody can still go to the grid and sell their power from a small renewable facility. My neighbor, Judy Putnam and the team uh, says, Bill Gates says the key to solving the energy crisis is innovation. What are the biggest opportunities for innovation in small hydro? Judy, I don't think there are any. Um, I mean, you know, one way that we've made some of these plants economically feasible where others couldn't is, you know, obviously by having automation and, and computers that run everything. So we have very low labor costs. I mean, that's, I don't consider that particularly innovative. Um, and there, one thing that people are working on is building turbines that are fish friendly. So that at some of the sites where there's a controversy about what's happening with the fish, you know, maybe the fish can pass right through the turbine without getting injured. So, uh, but neither of those, neither automation or fish friendly turbines are really gonna create a whole lot more small hydro. Um, I, I think what Bill Gates is getting at is innovation all over the place, you know, particularly in energy storage. Mark Neiser still wants to know, is the <laughs> jacket spotted owl left? I don't understand the question. Mark, you can't have my jacket. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap up soon. Uh, in the audience here, anyone? Yeah. You haven't really discussed the economics of this impact oh. on what we're going to be paying for electricity in the future. Yes, that's a question I was hoping to hear. What about the cost associated with all of this clean energy? You can tell I'm making good money, otherwise I wouldn't be wearing this leather jacket. <laughs> uh, seriously, I'm gonna rattle off some numbers. So what you and I pay at home for electricity in New Hampshire is about 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is the spot market price if somebody like me just dumps energy onto the grid without a contract, that's about three cents. So, and some small hydro can only get that rate and they're going out of business. Um, because we have net metering in New Hampshire, at least up to a megawatt of capacity, we get a better rate if we sort of assemble a group of people that'll use our energy, at least on paper, they don't literally run an extension cord to the plant, but it's called virtual net metering. And through net metering, we now get about seven and a half cents. So we're still less than half of the retail rate, but we're also more than double the floor rate. So that's, that's kind of the rates that we're getting. Now, the PUC has more or less established those rates such that there is no cost shifting to the rate payer. So at the end of the day, it's generally recognized that net metered plants are saving money for rate payers. Um, so is that, does that get it, the crux of your question? Envision the possibility of where a town would produce its own electricity so you reduce the transportation costs? Sure, although in this day of specialization, it's less likely the town would own the generation. Although in Sunapee, New Hampshire, the town actually owns a little hydro plant right in town. It's more likely to happen what is probably going to happen in Keene, which is that the city will you know, buy it from people like me who own hydro plants near the city. And you mentioned the transportation cost, you know, electricity, is, it's kind of hard to measure how it's transported or even describe how it's transported. But the important thing for the plants that I have outside of Keene is that they connect with Keene without going to the transmission system. They use the distribution system, which is low voltage, and it means we can move energy to them cheaply and without much loss. So in that sense, cities and towns using community power will, will likely use local hydro. Well, I think Yes, but I'm they doing that across the line in Massachusetts. You go down to Winston and they got thousands and thousands of solar panels. Uh, it's basically we're doing what you're saying with the hydro. Right? Yeah, I mean, the big solar projects you see in Massachusetts are typically they might not be going just to local towns. They, their energy, if they're big enough, might be hitting the grid. Yeah. And, you know, they, they might have power purchase agreements with distant, distant buyers. Um, the smaller solar fields you see in Massachusetts and New Hampshire are usually behind the meter, which means they're being net metered and used quite locally. That would be 
presume these are going to the grid they're so huge. Say again? I presume they're going into the grid they're so big. Some of the big ones that you see down there, yeah. If you know over 10 megawatts, those are probably just going up to the grid. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. We have a little reception doing. But before that, I was going to ask you, how do we respond to people who say, there is no climate crisis. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Chinese hoax, or uh, it's just the natural evolution of things and it'll fix itself. I was going to ask you that, but I don't think I will. <laughs> oh, I wanted to answer that. <laughs> well, I gave you that chance. I was then going to ask you what you would suggest that people like we lay people who don't have any, well, some online I think do have some sophistication, perhaps some others, but I know I don't. What can the average person do to help improve our climate? And you can have both or either of those questions. I'll answer both because they have the same answer. But, but first, to the second question, I mean, one thing people can do is obviously vote for elected officials who believe there is a climate crisis and who want to do something locally to promote local clean energy. So elect the right officials. You can also join some of these organizations that we've talked about, like Conservation Law Foundation and Citizens Climate Lobby, and there, there are plenty of others. But the broader answer, Joe, to both your questions, i.e., if a climate skeptic says to you, you know, what are you talking about? Aside from getting into the climate science, you can simply say, oh, you should practice energy efficiency because it saves you money and gives you more comfortable buildings to dwell in. If it's a climate believer and the question is, what can we do? It's the same answer. Practice more energy efficiency because it saves you money, it makes your buildings comfortable, and it reduces carbon. So... Bottom line is we need more energy efficiency in this country. Well, it's it's boring you. and not sexy, but that's the that's the Thank bottom line. Thank you so much for. for <laughs>